Uranus will be the most remote object visited by a spacecraft. Uh, it's so remote, in fact, it wasn't even discovered until just over 200 years ago. As a result, we know a lot less, much less, about Uranus than we knew about either Jupiter or Saturn before the first spacecraft flybys. And as a result, the opportunity for discovery and for surprises, I think, is even greater. It's interesting that Uranus is, the in interior of Uranus is really not all that different uh, to first order than the interior of the two larger, uh, its two larger neighbors. It's just that it has a much uh, shallower uh, envelope of hydrogen and helium. It's only about 5,000 miles deep. Uh, we believe that below that, and this is all based on pre-Voyager data, uh, that below that atmosphere of hydrogen and from ground-based data, there may be 40% helium, which would be quite remarkable. There is an ocean of melted ice, in other words, water, but which was accreted as solid ice. And it may have uh, in it uh, ammonia and uh, dissolved ammonia and methane. Here is a, an artist's sketch of uh, pre-Voyager view of what might be inside of Uranus and to scale an image of Earth. Here's the rock, uh, Earth-sized rocky core the ocean of mainly water with other dissolved materials in it, and the hydrogen and possibly significant amount of helium in the 5,000 mile deep uh, atmosphere. Now, one of the problems that we have uh, with, uh, one of the interesting things about Uranus uh, is uh, that it's tipped on its side, as is this uh, artist's view shows, with currently with the south polar region facing the sun. Uh, that, uh, leads to, we would expect, that should lead to a rather different weather system because on the average the polar regions receive more sunlight than the equatorial regions. Uh, and one model of, uh, of that, here is the sunlight on the, in this particular configuration as we approach, one model would predict that at, uh, at the pole the temperature uh, would be about 62 degrees centigrade above absolute zero. This corresponds to about minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit right here, uh, while the equator would be some uh, five or uh, uh, on the order of five to six degrees colder, and the other pole almost as warm as the pole which is being illuminated. That's one model of what we might actually see uh, in terms of a temperature distribution, and the weather system that should be produced by this rather different temperature distribution uh, could be quite, uh, quite interesting and quite different than anything we've seen before. We will fly by about this distance from Miranda, about 18,000 miles uh, inside of Miranda, uh, one, of the, one of the closest uh, satellite flybys we have yet had with the Voyager spacecraft. Well, what about these small icy moons? Uh, well, we know from ground-based data again uh, roughly what their size is. And uh, the, 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 uh, uh, this moon, for instance, is about 500 kilometers across or about 300 miles across. That's Miranda. While some of the larger moons are about 1,600 kilometers across or about 1,000 miles across. These are similar in size to the, uh, the intermediate-sized icy moons, which we uh, first uh, saw at, uh, at Saturn. I should point out the new moons which we've discovered are, lie right in here between the rings and Miranda in this region right here. The, uh, now, we don't know yet what these moons are made of. We know that they have water ice on their surface from ground-based data, but we don't know their masses accurately enough to know whether they're mainly water ice, which was the case for some of the Saturnian moons, uh, whether there's been enough melting so that if there was rock inside, it would have, it, well, if there's not enough melting, the rock could be well distributed. If the water ice melts, then the rock will sink, forming a core. And it's even possible that they're mainly rock. This is now shows you the bullseye approach. That's the ring system and the orbits of the previously known satellites. As I said, the new satellites are in this region right here. Here comes the spacecraft. You'll see the spacecraft will be rolling a great deal. That's because we, in order to, con to minimize the usage of the scan platform, uh, we have uh, rolled the space. Here's a stellar occultation. We observe the starlight, measuring it every 100 times a second as the star is observed through the rings. And that will allow uh, resolving structures in the rings on the scale of about 50 feet. These will very, be very accurate maps uh, of, the, of the shape of these narrow rings using the photopolarimeter, and we do that twice. This is, was one example of, of the stellar occultation. This now represents uh, the, uh, our best imaging of Oberon, which is the outermost known, uh, previously known satellite of Uranus. Now you can see the spacecraft is turned upside down in a certain sense, but it will continue to move, maneuver in this way as we, uh, as we uh, 
aim the cameras and other instruments at the various targets in the system. During this phase, we'll be, of course, taking images of the rings. We'll be taking numerous images of the atmosphere, trying to measure the wind patterns there, uh, occasionally interrupting to take the best images of the satellites. This is Umbriel, uh, and it, one of the, uh, this the third one out from the planet. And uh, as we pass through the ring plane itself, we would expect if there's a trapped radiation environment that that's where the maximum intensity in the uh, magnetic field would be and the maximum intensity in the radiation belts. Uh, this is now Titania, which is uh, fourth out from the planet. And this is the field of view of the narrow angle camera, which is to indicate how large the object will appear in the field of view. And you notice there were two images taken uh, of Titania. Uh, as you know, the spacecraft is getting aligned so that we can best detect any plasma as we move through the ring plane. We'll also be taking images of the rings on edge as we go through the ring plane. This is uh, Ariel, the second one out, and you can see now the object appears large enough that we have to start mosaicing it. And we also have to do image motion compensation because the, the uh, exposures are so long that uh, we have to move the spacecraft to compensate for the smear which would be introduced. And this is Miranda, the innermost previously known moon. This is the one we fly only 18,000 miles from its surface. Uh, we'll be imaging things which are on the order of a half a mile across at closest approach. Now you can see we're moving on to the dark side of the, of the planet. Uh, you can see the uh, nine rings, and it's during this time period, especially when we're behind the planet, we'll be able to image uh, the rings and forward scattering. But before that happens, though, you'll see uh, first the sun and then followed behind a small blue dot, which is the Earth. And we'll, we're sitting on the Earth watching. Here's the sun. There's the Earth. And we'll, from Earth, we'll be watching the radio from the spacecraft transmitted through the rings. And similarly, as the sun sets, we'll mount, mount, measure it with ultraviolet on the spacecraft, and as from the Earth, we'll be measuring the radio waves coming from the spacecraft. And we repeat the whole process again as the sun comes out, we watch it with the ultraviolet, and from, from the Earth, we watch the radio beam uh, as it comes uh, into view again uh, to Earth right here. And then finally, we watch from Earth the transmission through the rings of the uh, radio beam from the spacecraft in order to measure the uh, particle size distribution. And it's during this time period that we would expect to have our best view of the backlighted rings uh, of any uh, lightning and uh, aurora auroral activity on the dark pole of Uranus. Okay, at this point, I guess Brad Smith is next, and uh, he's going to hopefully show us some pictures. The uh, first slide is uh, one that, uh, an image that you've already seen. It was uh, released yesterday. Uh, we see a normal and a, uh, a highly stretched false color version here. The normal view is Uranus much as you would see it if you were riding on the spacecraft approaching the planet. And you can see practically nothing here at all. We are talking about very low contrast phenomena. This is the very highly stretched version. And if you look very, very carefully, you might just see a hint of that here. I can see it, but I don't know whether everyone else can. Just a hint of what's there over here. What we're seeing over here is, um, uh, again, very, very weakly now, a sort of brownish haze that hangs over the south polar region. Uh, we have now detected clouds in the atmosphere of Uranus, and they are very, very low contrast. Now, uh, this one ha tends to have a somewhat orange color and shows up quite well in these orange pictures. We're seeing just a piece of the planet in each view, but you can see it's moving. It moves from here to here to here to here as the planet rotates. That means we have some information on how long it takes a feature to go around Uranus. At uh, a latitude of about uh, 25 degrees or so, we found a feature that goes around in about 17 hours. At 33 degrees, which I think is this fellow right here, it goes around in about 16 and a quarter hours. And we have found uh, still another feature that's sort of in the mid-latitudes, up to about 45 degrees or so, and that goes around in 15 hours. Now, this doesn't mean that Uranus doesn't know what it's doing. It just says that the atmosphere is kind of slippery. In other words, the atmosphere is rotating differentially with respect to the deep interior of the planet. In other words, there are winds there. We have uh, 
attempted to make a, uh, a color uh, picture of this, uh, of this cloud. It's uh, a kind of a noisy image, uh, but you can see it up here. Here again is that sort of brownish uh, uh, polar haze. And uh, here's the, the sort of orangey cloud moving along. These things, the bigger part in the pole is uh, right, about, right about here. These donut-looking things are um, bits of dust that have uh, formed on the optics of the cameras. And uh, we are trying to uh, work on a processing technique that will, uh, that will eliminate them and make somewhat better uh, images cosmetically, but for the time being, we, we just have to live with those artifacts. Uh, shortly after the first of the year, another six satellites were found. Uh, this satellite, by the way, is about halfway between the rings and Miranda. Uh, the additional six satellites were all between the rings and this satellite. And I show you here just an image which happened to contain three of these new satellites uh, in one single uh, view. Here's the Epsilon ring. And uh, here we see 86U1, uh, U3, and U4. Okay, as we approached Uranus, and this is just a, uh, a mosaic of, of several images, uh, the rings really began to show up quite well. Here's the Epsilon ring. You begin to see a few of the, uh, of the inner rings just barely showing up. And of course, what we were interested in looking for were these shepherding satellites, the satellites that control these rings, hold them together, keep them from diffusing out. And um, uh, a couple days ago, we were, in fact, successful in uh, picking up two of these, uh, of these shepherding satellites. Now, here we see them, 1986U7, uh, just inside the Epsilon ring, and 1986U8, just outside the Epsilon ring. Uh, just because of the, the, uh, the processing that was used to bring out both the faint rings and these satellites, uh, you see a sort of ringing effect here, a little dark band on either side of the Epsilon ring. That, of course, is, a, is an artifact. Uh, and that's all I have uh, for this morning. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a Q&A here. Addressing this, this idea of process, uh, talking to uh, Rich Terrell during the, the Saturn flyby a few years ago, and uh, came up with the term trying to do instant science, which is, is what is trying to be done now, primarily because there's a press corps here. Uh, to anyone just addressing that problem of trying to come up with answers uh, that uh, we didn't even know the questions existed 24 hours ago and try to interpret a picture that many of us are really just seeing for the first time. And has anything in effect changed since the Voyager 2 Saturn encounter to make this trying to do instant science between the cracks an easier process? Yeah, I, I, I've already commented on that. Instant science, of course, is always a dangerous thing to do. And when you're dealing with, uh, with subtle phenomena, it becomes even more dangerous. That's why we are taking a somewhat more conservative position this time in not uh, in taking a little more time and doing a little additional processing before we uh, draw our, our early conclusions on the data. But I do think that having had both Jupiter and Saturn as a basis does help us. Sure. Uh, give, I mean, it opens up our eyes and our, our, our minds to other possibilities. Obviously, each time we see a new planet, it really broadens our horizons, and that means that the next planet is then less surprising in a certain sense and perhaps easier to try to comprehend. So even though, even though Uranus is really brand new stuff, uh, the second guessing is better because of Jupiter and Saturn exactly. and the modeling that's been done. Exactly. For Dr. Stone, uh, you had mentioned the profile of temperature of the atmosphere as being very warm at the South Pole where it's facing the sun, then cool at the equator, mm -hmm. and then you had it warm again at the North Pole. What's yes, making right. it warm there? I'm sorry, it stays warm. It turns out that Uranus is so cold that it cools off very slowly compared to the length of its year. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like having a fruit cellar. If you keep something underground, its temperature doesn't change very much. Same thing is true for the polar regions. Their temperature changes very slowly. Uh, over a period of a year. So it's just a quest the point is over a year, on the average, the poles receive more sunlight than the equator, and therefore they're on the average warmer, and they stay warmer. Now, how much warmer is depends upon all these other issues, like how much internal heat source there is, how much transport of heat there is from the pole to the equator, none of which is known. So it could turn out the temperature could be quite uniform if there's a very vigorous mechanism for transporting the heat from the, from the pole to the equator. That's what we expect to find out.